Okay, good day. Um, my name is Mark Butcher. I'm the Managing Director and one of the guides at Mdela Safari Lodges in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm an ex-National Parks Game Ranger, uh, and I've been working in and around Wangi National Park for just over 40 years now. Um, one of the things that's always interesting to talk about that's very close to my, to my soul is about the human wildlife conflict. Okay, it's a common, commonly used cliche in conservation and ecotourism today, but whether or not how we can turn this human wildlife conflict into perhaps, can it be an opportunity? And I really believe that the story behind Mdela Safari Lodges is a, a success story about doing just that. Okay, for those of you not familiar with the geography, Zimbabwe, country in South Central um, Africa, bordering Botswana to the west, South Africa to the south, and specifically our story is about the northwest of Zimbabwe, um, the Victoria Falls area and Wangi National Park. Wangi is very, very close to my soul, 5,000 square miles, 50,000 elephants, one of Africa's great forgotten parks. I've been heavily involved in the conservation of it for many years now. Okay, but what's even more interesting about this whole story is that this is really the heartland of what I believe, what I believe is the heartland of the Kabango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. Now that's a mouthful, but what's exciting about it is it is the biggest um, protected conservation area on the planet today. Okay, it's a huge tract of land spanning um, a big portion of not only Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, and Namibia, but even now also southern and southeastern Angola. Okay, and within the boundaries, what is the CASA, TFCA, are 250,000 elephants. Okay, and this is more than 50% of the total population of elephants on the planet, plus huge populations of a lot of endangered predators, such as wild dogs, cheetahs, lions, uh, even animals like giraffe, sable, and roan. Um, it's a, just a very, very exciting um, and visionary concept in uh, Pan-African conservation. And Wangi is uh, one of the birthplaces of uh, what today is, has, is now known as, as the Kabango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. Okay, and in Delo Safari Lodges, what we've tried to do is we've built up a circuit of lodges in northwestern Zimbabwe in the heartland of what I call Kaza, of what's, of what's called Kaza. And we've tried to make all these very, very different uh, activities um, for our international guests at all of our lodges that are in different places, both around Victoria Falls and around Hwangi National Park. But what we've done and what we've done differently is how we do, uh, how we link uh, communities and conservation. And a lot of this is because quite simply, we have put lodges not uh, nearby community lands, but actually on community lands. Our story really starts with Gorge's Lodge. And Gorge's Lodge really started when, as a young ranger, I remember visiting uh, Victoria Falls on weekends off and used to see tourists um, traveling between Victoria Falls Airport and the hotels in town, mostly owned by multinationals, throwing candy out of the windows of their buses at kids on the side of the road. These are the kids that are living in this communal land, this community land around Victoria Falls. And the horrible images and the gut-wrenching horror of that, of that, of that um, scenario uh, used to really tear me up. And one of the things we decided to do was we said, okay, we have to get the tourism out of town. We've got to get tourism out of Victoria Falls. We've got to get it out of the parks and start putting tourism on community land. And this was the birth of Gorge's Lodge. We built it back in the early 1990s. And not only has it got spectacular views and provide a wonderful experience for our guests, but in the background of that picture, you can see the white buildings off over there. Those are our landlords. Those are the communities and the people in those communities who we've been paying rentals and concession fees to for the past 30 years. And it really is a, a very successful, true ecotourism product. When we started it, it was one of the first on community land. And even today, it's still one of the biggest actually on community land. Very different paradigm from building on uh, government land or on private land. And of course, this is a picture back from uh, when the birth of Mbelo Safari Lodges, which is around 2011. Um, this is one of our photographers that we first brought in uh, and visiting the local schools and showing these kids some of the things that can go on and some of the fun that can be had by actually interacting with tourists and learning about them and talking with them as opposed to having them throwing candy at you. Um, and that was how a lot of what we do today started. Okay, part of our story is also about Bomani. And Bomani was a a camp that we built outside of Wangi National Park, but right on the very, very boundary of the communal lands. And to me, this was a stepping stone to what grew later. 
Um, and Bamani is a wonderful capital today. Guests come from all over the world and can enjoy the wildlife. And there's Queenie and some of her cheetah walking through the, the lodge one day. But really, and most importantly, it was the birth of what became and is today Camelthorn Lodge. In Camelthorn Lodge, we built on community land, just like gorges. And when we first spoke to the communities there back in the 1990s, they were very reticent about giving land, uh, setting land aside uh, for tourism. Um, and today we built this wonderful lodge we're very, we're very, very proud of. Uh, the chief at the time, Chief Marapula, stressed us that he didn't want a tented camp. What he wanted actually was for us to build a permanent lodge that would be there for our children's children. And of course, today our guests have a wonderful time. They can visit Wangi National Park nearby there, have bush lunches. Here's a great image I love of the elephants trundling past on their way to a waterhole while he's excited tourists are taking photos of them. Bush lunches next to the waterhole. With, uh, and that's one of my great friends, Ephraim, at, at the back there, he's serving lunch. Uh, he's a retired ex-poacher ex who no longer plies his trade, but he works for us and keeps guests happy and they have a great time. Great, great to bob with. And there's one of my favorite lionesses, Nomvelo. She's there, one of the matriarchs of the Ngamo pride, easily recognizable by those cauliflower ears. And that's one of her cubs uh, that she gave birth to in 2018, who's grown up now to be a, a young boy. And that's one of the young boys in the foreground there. You can see Nonvelo on the back left with her cauliflower ears. And there's some more of her cubs there from 2019. A uh, large, big, stable lion pride that lives on the Ngamo Plains. One of, the other, one of my other favorites that live on the Ngamo Plains around Bamani and Camelthorn is this uh, female cheetah. We call her Queenie. We always call her Queen of the Plains, but we call her Queenie for short. And that year, a couple of years back, she um, had five cubs in her litter. What is very cool was out of those five cubs, and this is a testament to Queenie and her skills as a, a super mom cheetah, she raised four of them. And in that picture, Queenie's on the top left, the three of her sons are there, and then her daughter, the only daughter in the litter, is uh, a cheetah that later became known as Cindy. That's her lower down on the tree, sitting on her bum. What happened, what happened after those cheetah dispersed as young teenagers, and in inverted commas, they dispersed as Queenie, the female, must have gone into the communal lands and she got into trouble there. You can see she came back from a, a, a sojourn carrying a, a wire snare around her neck. Uh, and I'm not sure if that was a snare, it's probably set to catch a, a diker or something around somebody's fields, but Queenie got caught in it. She managed to break free and came home with that. We spent quite a bit of time relocating and when we did relocate her after first seeing that snare around her neck, um, we called in some guys and they darted her. And here's Paul de Montiel stuck a dart into her, uh, tranquilized her. And here we managed to get the snare off of um, the cheetah that later became known as Cindy. Okay, and that young female survived the event. And uh, she actually flourished too. And this was a picture I took last year in 2019, in the early part of the year, green season. And there, Cindy is with her first litter of cubs, four, four young cheetah, and she's there. They, getting stuck into a young impala that Cindy had caught for them. And that picture I love as well, it was taken a few months later. Unfortunately, Cindy had lost a couple of her youngsters, but she, um, there's one of her boy cubs with her there, and he's learning his trade from her while she's hunting on the Ngamo Plains. And that there is those three young cheetah that are now growing up, and that's a picture I just took just a short time ago, a couple of weeks ago, and they now have dispersed from their mom, uh, and they're out hunting and hunting on the Ingamo Plains. Um, and I'll come back to the story of these three young male cheetah, because they're part of the story we're going to tell today. But a lot of the story that I've been telling you around tourism and all the wonderful animals that live in paradise and all the tourists that come to visit us in paradise in Wangi National Park and around Victoria Falls is only part of the story. And this is a Google Earth snapshot uh, of the Wangi National Park boundary around the Ingamo. And on the left side of your screen there, you can see what is Wangi National Park, and then the boundary of the park. You can see the double trace line, the fire guard, that separates the park from the community land. And the community land is on the right. And that checkerboard of squares, each one of those squares is a uh, field belonging to a sub subsistence farmer. So you can see living around the boundaries of the park, they clearly are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families of people. And these are the people 
that were um, disenfranchised by the colonial government from the benefits of living next door to Wangi National Park. But all these people live next door to paradise. I spoke earlier and I told you that subsistence farmers, so whether when you're a subsistence farmer, that means you have to grow all your own food, okay? So what happens here is they plant millet, corn, and they grow food for, to feed their families. But of course, what happens if you're growing um, millet and corn next door to what is one of the biggest elephant populations on the planet inside Wangi National Park, these huge herbivores uh, do not respect boundaries. And here's an elephant bull in the green season coming straight out of Wangi National Park. And he's headed straight off to go and cause trouble. And this picture here is a picture I take of four big six-ton bull elephants inside a field of millet. And you can imagine the chaos they, that they cause there. Not only do they eat all the millet and corn in, in that field, but they trample it all too, and watermelons and everything. Now, if you're a subsistence farmer and these elephants uh, flatten your field, that means your family does not eat that year. There is no food. The kids are going to uh, go hungry. Instead of eating two or three meals a day, you're going to be down to one meal every second day or something like that. The second thing that happens is people in Southern Africa, particularly in Zimbabwe, uh, they're pastoralists um, and all your wealth is tied up in livestock, whether it be cattle or goats or donkeys. But that's where you keep your wealth. And when very important, when grandma gets sick or something happens that um, you can sell a cow, which can now help uh, generate some revenue so, can, so that grandma can go to hospital. And here I'm going to go back to the story in the picture of those three young cheetahs. Now those three young male cheetahs are just dispersing from their mothers. And what's happening, they're not very good hunters and they're a little bit lazy. And these are the three of them now and they're actually inside the communal land. They've left the park. And there is no wildlife in the communal land. They're up to no good. When they're up to no good, this is what happens, okay? And this is a villager's calf, okay? And these calves are very, very valuable. This is money uh, for those um, villagers. And every time they lose one, lose one of those animals, that's one of the consequences they have to pay for living next door to paradise. And of course, when you want to, this is a, a photograph of a typical family living next door to paradise. You can see clearly malnourished, clearly hungry, poverty-stricken people. And you've got hungry, poverty-stricken people living next door to a lot of wildlife and animals like these wildebeest, that too is also gonna end up with, in trouble. And here's a photo of some drying elephant meat from a poacher's camp inside the park. And this is the kind of thing that would happen, you know, when your kids are hungry and your kids are starving, um, a lot of people end up just going into, into the park and poaching. Um, and I'm not sure that I wouldn't do the same thing if my kids were kind of hungry. So it's very, very hard to, um, to say that uh, any, any one of us wouldn't do the same kind of thing in their shoes. Uh, and of course, this harks back to a picture from the bad old days. Hey? Uh, it's one of my anti-poaching patrols about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, what's happened here is a lot of wire has been stolen from one of the veterinary fences. Uh, the poachers have made wire snares. These are kind of lassoes that they put on um, game trails. And wildlife that walks down the game trails is caught in the wire snares. And of course, now we've got a dead buffalo and uh, a great big problem arising. Now, those wire snares are very unspecific in who they're going to kill. They don't just kill buffalo or kudu, but even cut off the trunks of uh, our beloved elephant. And you can imagine an elephant with a short trunk, how difficult life is for that elephant. And this picture here harks back to what we inherited as a, a legacy of our colonial past, you know is national parks within uh, throughout Africa, not just in Zimbabwe, were protected places full of animals and wildlife that were there for the benefit of the tourists that came from overseas. And uh, the people who lived around the outside spent their lives poaching. So we had animals leaving the park, going and raiding crops, going raiding livestock. And then we had people coming from outside the park going in and poaching. So we ended up with this militarization of our park boundaries. And I always call it a low intensity guerrilla warfare. That was what uh, we all had to, were involved in the 1980s and 1990s along the Wangi National Park boundaries. That's a picture of National Geographic took in circa 1990 or 1992. Okay, so here we have a map of Wangi National Park, and I'm particularly interested in the southern boundary. The southern boundary borders uh, onto the Chilotchokonda land, 
And this, I believe, is one of the largest uh, interfaces of both wildlife inside the park and people outside the park. Uh, certainly on the Wangi National Park boundary and perhaps even on the whole Kaza boundary. Largest, very, very large um, uh, uh, dry season elephant densities, plus also very, very large uh, human populations. And of course, we're sick and tired of fighting this uh, low intensity guerrilla warfare that we were fighting during the 70s and 80s and 90s. So what we decided to do is we had to, we were gonna try and do things differently. We're gonna change things. We're gonna reinvent this paradigm. We're gonna bring tourism out of the park and put tourism amongst the communities. Now to start off, the first thing you need is you obviously need uh, a patch of real estate that's gonna have tourism potential. And the Ngamal Plains, obviously clearly a very, very good example of that. These wide open, beautiful savannas, um, that um, uh, in, have wildlife and certainly are a, a picturesque paradise for tourism to come to We're on the very, very edge of Wangi National Park. One of the first things we chose, we said, okay, we chose a spot to build a camp. And that's that, uh, that huge camel thorn tree on the community land, which you saw a picture of earlier. This was the day we first chose our spot for a, a lodge. When we started talking to communities, a lot of them were, were not very interested at all in bringing tourism onto their land. They'd been um, bullied and harassed and criminalized because they lived next to Wangi National Park and they really weren't very interested in it. And that picture there I love, that's my partner, that's in Jabulo Zondo. He's been, we, he and I have been partners since the 1990s. And I'm an ex-game ranger, but he's a social scientist. Um, and uh, in Jabulo's great uh, skill is in talking to people and talking to communities and explaining difficult concepts to them. And this was why Bamani was really important to us. And that's a picture taken in the dining room of Bamani Lodge, okay? Right on the edge of, of the park, right bordering onto the communal lands, in the very periphery of uh, where most tourism was. We could start bringing people from the communities into the lodge and start showing them what was tourism. You can imagine the people that lived in the villages had never been involved in tourism, they'd never seen it. In fact, they'd been completely disenfranchised from it uh, through the colonial era. So here was a great opportunity to show them what tourism was. This is a tourism lodge. This is what we envision. This is what we want to do on your land, guys. Um, and that led to some of these meetings here. And in that picture there, there's a good uh, five or six of the people that were at the very, very beginning um, of uh, the tourism program in, uh, in uh, Chilocho and in this district. And there's Hedman Johnson, uh, Nobe, Tenjwa, Moyo, headmaster still today at uh, Ngomo Primary School. Uh, Aaron Yoni, the counselor from Ward 3, and Baba Mlevo, um, uh, who's a direct descendant of the Kamalo family, and he's our, our sub-chief uh, based at Mlevo Village. And he was the guy who first sat down and said, all right, let's give this tourism a chance. Let's, let's try, let's try, let's, uh, let's give these guys some land on, um, on, on our land and let's uh, set something aside to, to start uh, a tourism opportunity here. And from that, Chief Marupula had said to us that he didn't want a tented camp. He wanted a permanent lodge. He wanted something that will be here for our children's children. And we started to build Camelthorn Lodge. And Camelthorn, just the same way as we built Gorgeous Lodge 10, 15 years previously, um, we built it out of stone and thatch. And I keep this picture a lot because this was a picture I took one day when I'd gone out to go and pay staff. And we had 83 young men and women working here that day because I knew we were paying them. And 63 of them were working for the first time in their lives. This is, you can imagine young fathers and young mothers getting paid cash money and taking that home to their, to their families for the first time in their lives. You can imagine the effect that started right from day one when we started changing people's lives in those communities. And this is the development of that lodge. Here yeah, the thatch is going on underneath that camel thorn tree we saw earlier. Uh, and this is how this thing is built up. Today we built it up to this huge, um, uh, program that has invested millions of dollars into social services into these communities. And it all starts from building a lodge on community land. Just something different and something we're very, very proud of. Um, I've often had people say, well, I don't want to come to your lodge because you're not inside the park. And I say, well, that's exactly the point. We are outside the park because we chose to be there. We chose to be there for the very, very best reasons. To help conservation, to help community, and help these people who have been disenfranchised by the colonial era. Exciting um, program that we've got developing now too is the communities have taken it one step further. They've decided to set up wildlife sanctuaries on their own land uh, bordering the national park. So what their vision is and the vision that we've brought into with them, 
is that one day not only will visitors come to the area and pay to go into Wangi National Park, but they'll also pay to come into our, their own private wildlife sanctuaries. And that money straight away can be started to be used for um, social development and um, uh, improving people's lives. And this is the formation of our Cobra's Wildlife Protection Unit. Um, and these are the young recruits here training. They're not ex-soldiers, they're not ex-game rangers, they're not ex-policemen. Uh, these are young men we've taken out of the villages and we're training uh, to be able to look after their own wildlife resources on their own land. One of my other favorite programs is our school lunch program. All started because we started taking people to visit the schools and communities in our area. And the philanthropy that has devolved from our guests is overwhelming. In 2016, we served over 412,000 school lunches to nearly 2,700 kids. Last year, during the drought of 2019, we surpassed even that and served over half a million school lunches to more than 2,700 kids in 13 different schools. I'm really, really proud of what we've achieved here. Um, a lot of people talk about helping schools and helping feed kids, but very few people do it on the scale that we do. And this is all with the help of our guests and help with our, all of our donors, and we thank them all. And of course, you know, water. Madibililand North, the province in which we live is dry. Most of the water comes from underground water. And no community can be healthy without clean well water. And we've already drilled over 80 new wells and equipped them with pumps uh, to pump water to the surface. Uh, and this particular well, I love the picture of it because we put the well there to help the clinic. That's the Pepper Clinic in the background there. But the well not only helps the clinic, but also helps these young, young girls from the uh, Pepper High School and uh, local moms and their families. And their families are now drinking clean, healthy water. And of course, the community's health improves accordingly. And this picture here is a picture from the doll, old days as well. One of the heroes of Zimbabwean society, that lady teacher there, we're trying to teach all these kids in a crowded classroom block. We've got over 40 kids. You can see them sitting on the floor, they're sharing benches, trying to get educated here. And you can imagine the struggle to educate kids in an environment like this. But we've taken it one step further. We said, okay, we need to improve the situation. And using our own resources, using philanthropy from our guests, We've built 13 new classroom blocks down there. Okay, now not only are we just painting, painting classroom blocks, but we've actually built the whole infrastructure. On this particular day, I love this picture because these old kids in a new classroom, you can imagine this is a place where young kids can start their education. We've got a fighting chance to maybe pass some exams one day. And this picture I love too. This is a picture of uh, one of those heroes of our, of our Zimbabwean education system. Uh, we have one of the highest literacy rates in Africa, and it's thanks to our teachers. And that lady teacher there, she was living in that hut on the right-hand side with four lady teachers living inside that hut down at uh, Mchaeli. And uh, on the left there is the new teacher's college. We built that uh, lady uh, teacher, and there she's just about to move into her new cottage, and she had she tears running down her cheeks. But what I love about that image is you can see what the local community did. They carved that elephant into the thatch on that new cottage because uh, suddenly there's this very, very strong linkage between benefits and living next door to paradise, living next door to elephants, and suddenly we've got benefits devolving directly to them. Huge paradigm sh uh, change from our old colonial past. One of my other favorite programs that we run is our uh, Wanky School Books Project, started by Lindsay Norman Isabel Lynch uh, from Bomani. Um, they've already done nearly 32 thousand books have been distributed into the communities and the schools around our lodges. That's 32,000 books. Now these are not just hand me down books that come from America or from uh, overseas, but these are not only curriculum school books for the classes, but also contextual reading books that are set, stories told and illustrated within the villages where they live that kids can read and relate to and it can help improve literacy and give them a fighting chance. And that image on the right I love. You can imagine a, uh, an older sibling reading to his kid brother and teaching him how to, how to read. What a wonderful program this is. One of my other favorite programs that started at our lodges had some visiting dentist, Diego Romero. There he is on the left and he every year now, he brings 18 Spanish and Italian doctors who come and do a, a free smile. And they do a free care for all the people that live around Wangi National Park all the way up to Victoria Falls. Um, and in its ninth year last year in 2019, we saw, um, 20, we, we saw nearly our 27,000th patients. Okay, we've seen a total of 26,453 patients since 2011 in nine years of operations. 
Uh, my best estimate is probably around 70 or 80,000 free procedures we provided to the poor people who live around Wangi National Park and Victoria Falls, not only to their mouths, but for their eyes as well. And that's a great picture there because that's about what the next level is. Not only are we taking care of problems, but we're getting involved in preventative care. And here's um, happy school kids with their toothbrushes and Colgate, um, and they're taking care of their teeth now, and hopefully going to grow up with less problems. And there's one of our guides, Petele, who's a grandson of that gentleman I introduced you to earlier, Baba Mlevo. Uh, and he's involved in our program now, and what a proud young Zimbabwean he is. And it's not only about teeth, it's about um, eyesight. Um, I'm an older guy as well, and I need, to, I need a pair of spectacles to read. Can you imagine being uh, so poor that you can't afford a pair of spectacles to read? Um, and it's just life-changing when we start handing out spectacles to, to, to these people, both young and old, and suddenly they, have, they can read again, and they can see, and they're not tripping over their own feet. And this brings me to where we are, you know. We've got three kind of elements here. We've got wildlife and we've got tourists and we've got communities. And what's absolutely wonderful is when you finally tie them all together. And in Zimbabwe, during our hard times, we had wildlife and communities, but we didn't have tourists, we didn't have visitors. So we didn't have an engine to drive our uh, ecotourism model. But now with um, uh, tourism improving and more and more people coming, not just staying inside the parks, not just staying in the hotels in Victoria Falls, but coming out of the parks and coming and visiting our communities, we've got things driving forward. And I really am excited about um, this being a sustainable ecotourism model that involves wildlife, communities, and tourism. Thanks very much.